Hello everyone, welcome to today's Lunch and Learn Garden webinar. We appreciate everyone joining us today and we'll have a good time, learn a little bit, and we'll entertain some questions towards the end of this taped uh, extension webinar. My name is David Rodriguez. I'm with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. I'm an extension horticulturalist here in Bear County and San Antonio. Here's my email address. So if you have any follow up questions after this webinar today or anything related to gardening or landscape, please do not hesitate to send me an email. If you need something to identify a plant, an insect disease or other, uh, do send high quality images attached to the email and not as part of it. So today's um, topic is getting ready now for a fall vegetable garden and let's look at that big a there so by the time we finish today's webinar and hopefully you'll follow all the steps by steps of success that's what we want you and your family to have by the end of this season's uh, gardening is an a and that's what we're focusing on today on the principles and best practices of getting that vegetable garden ready we're not going to be covering too many specific crops, but more of the principles. And we have other webinars scheduled, uh, like tomatoes and then fall and winter vegetables scheduled in August. That uh, we'll show you a slide towards the end here that hopefully you can attend as well. So uh, today's chat, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, uh, there's a guidelines that we have there. And, um, and then uh, send us a chat and we'll answer the questions here towards the end. So a little bit about the extension service. The Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service was started through our land grant universities with President Abraham Lincoln during the War of the States, signing the Morrow Act on July 2nd, 1862, which instituted these higher public universities of higher education to support agriculture and higher education throughout the states. So Texas A&M Agri AgriLife Extension Service has been uh, in Texas for since 1914, over 100 years. So we have a long lasting legacy and tradition and we're the educational arm of the land grant university in the 254 counties in our great state of Texas. So we are funded separately from our land grant university, Texas A&M University, the oldest institute of public higher education in our great state of Texas. So the principles when we cover gardening or landscape is earth time. So earth kind, we all need to be better stewards of our environment. So our recommendations are based upon real world effect effectiveness and environmental responsibility. So we give the best scientifically proven and the tested time, both traditional and conventional, as well as natural and organic gardening and landscape practices, earth kind environmental stewardship. If you get an opportunity to learn more about the earth kind program, please go to the Aggie Horticulture website and on the home page, uh, do take the earth kind challenge and read up of all the different uh, subject matter on the earth kind environmental stewardship program. So since we're located here in Bear County and San Antonio, the information that we will give you today is typically for our area, but within a hundred miles or so of Bear County, for sure the seven satellite counties uh, adjacent to Bear County and the 100 mile radius. But a lot of the information that we're gonna cover today is just good principles that anywhere in the state would be applicable for your success to get that A this uh, planting season. So here, uh, we have the opportunity, if you plant it right and prepare the area and plant the right plants and maintain them, you can have vegetables growing uh, 12 months out of the year. We have a major spring planting season and we have a major fall planting season. 
South Bear County and the and the county south southwest down into the valley, um, our, uh, at one time was the bread basket, the winter garden of the U.S. Of course, it's diminished some with urban sprawl, but we have a long lasting tradition. And for backyard gardeners, especially, gardening is still this nation's number one hobby. So we know it's hot. July and August are super, super hot. Typically the two hottest months of the year. The oven typically turns on around mid-June and continues through about mid-September. So we just make it work and we usually finish our spring vegetable garden, typically during the month of June, about the 4th of July weekend. It's pretty much finished unless you're growing really, really warm weather crops like uh, hot peppers and and things like that, okra and things like that. But normally we finish up and we start again with fresh uh, planting going into the fall season. So when does fall start? So this year fall starts September the 22nd and it concludes December 24, 21st and then goes into the winter months. So we often say that the fall season is fall is for planting. Not only your cool weather vegetables during the months of September and October, but most of your landscape plants, trees, shrubs, hardy perennials, ground covers, and things like that. So when, it, in, when, it, when we start talking about fall and winter vegetable gardening, what about now? What, what do we need to do? Well, our main focus is uh, preparing and getting the area ready for fall planting. We know it's super, super hot. A lot of us have been spending more time barbecuing, but look at that plant on the barbecue grill. And if we don't set things out right and properly with the hottest uh, two months of July and August, it's gonna be just like that dead plant on that barbecue grill. So we really have to slow things down, focus, and really follow these guidelines that we're gonna kind of uh, stress here. So this is uh, one of my old mentors, Dr. Jerry Parsons, uh, the weekend gardener. Dr. Parsons is a retired extension horticulturalist. And if you and uh, if you get an opportunity to go to Dr. Jerry Parsons, plantanswers.com, has a lot of wonderful uh, archived horticulture and landscape information on that website. And Dr. Parsons used to do a lot of videos before everything uh, became very um, more popular, but these are old videos and he has one taped here of how to water. And he was showing this silly video, basically how to water your garden asparagus bed in the background after we had a flooding event. You know, that's how Texas is in a lot of parts. It's drought, back to drought, and then we have rain, which floods at times, as you see in this slide here. So July and August, the key of planting during this time frame going into the fall is watering and watering properly. Remember, plants do not waste water. People waste water. So that's not Dr. Parsons having that hose on for two weeks straight flooding that area. He's just being a little silly to kind of show some principles of proper irrigation. We know water, uh, we try to bank it uh, in and around our gardens, our landscape, our lawns. Nine, 10 months out of the year, we're using uh, it, uh, efficiently and effectively 12 months out of the year. But you know, when we bank our water, we use it when we really need it for growing fruits and vegetables, edible crops, and the peak of the heat of July and August, and use it um, very conservatively throughout the rest of the year because it's getting expensive and it's harder to come about. So here's are some of the major principles of growing vegetables in your home garden, community garden, school garden, or small acre production. A lot of these that we're gonna show you are very simple, very basic. And, but we need to review them and we reviewed them often because these are the same mistakes. Unfortunately, people are making in year in and year out. So these principles are not only for your spring vegetable garden, 
but also for going into the fall vegetable garden as well. So it's hot. July and August is hot. Uh, around mid-September, on daytime, nighttime temperatures start cooling down. Days become shorter. But the key for good vegetable production is sunlight. You need plenty of sun, full sun, ideally eight to 10 hours of all day full sun to grow all these vegetables, especially vegetables that are what we refer to typically as warm weather vegetables, fruits and berries that have seeds in them, uh, tomatoes, peppers, squash, zucchini, cucumbers, just to name a few. Now, when we go into the cooler time and transition to cool weather crops, mainly leafy type crops, greens, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and all your root crops, you might be able to get away with six hours, but really sunlight is the key, excellent air circulation. So when we plan what we're planting, what we're planting, and we're letting these plants have ample space for proper air circulation, sunlight to be able to get into your garden to harvest, to do weed management, water, fertility, et cetera, you know, we wanna make sure that we're minimizing uh, that these plants are not having issues with disease or insects. So that's all that has a big part of it. Here's a silly picture. Uh, people's intentions are good, but the success is not an A, it's probably a D minus. As we see this picture, uh, this person's trying to grow some tomatoes uh, up a pecan tree and then little uh, squash plants on the bottom. So we know it's not gonna have ample sunlight. Um, and then we're having the competition of that big tree's root system. So, you know, it, this is a silly slide, but the key here is we wanna make sure sun is very important to grow these plants and that we're providing that uh, for the plants throughout the growing season. This is the biggest downfall that we see often for backyard gardeners, community gardeners, school gardens as well, is proper weed management. I've seen many of an organic garden uh, uh, go from pulling weeds, grubbing weeds, and then throwing their hands up and then using herbicides. All these products are safe as our American farmers use them, but as long as we follow and read label instructions, all those herbicides will be used correctly, they'll be fine. But you don't want your plants, especially young plants, to compete against Bermuda grass or other unwanted weeds because they're thieves. They're robbing nutrition. They're robbing the moisture from the soil and then they're bringing in issues of insects that will go onto your vegetable plants. So start out in, in an area that's full sun, good air circulation, but make sure you start on a very, very clean, pristine area. No weeds, no grasses, very clean. And take your time to work that area so you're, you're not uh, fighting the weeds once everything starts plant, uh, getting planted later. So. If you have to use herbicides, use them correctly in the right types and always read and follow label instructions. This is a prime example. This is a community garden here having a two or three work days, cleaning up the mess that we saw here because they refuse to use appropriate herbicides and they hand pulled everything and spent a lot of time and you know, they could be doing other projects in their garden and things like that. And, and then uh, guess what? Soon after they plant it within four or five, six weeks, it looked the same. So, you know, herbicides have their place out there, just the same of hand pulling a weed or using a sharp grubbing hole. But if you can't get these weeds, Bermuda and other under control, then again, herbicide, don't rule that out of your arsenal. Always start clean and always start pristine because we know that we have a lot of things that we need to get accomplished. And a lot of us don't have 20 people that can help us maintain our garden as well. Plant nutrition. 
when you're growing fruits and vegetables, depending on the part of the state that you have, some of us don't have the best soils. So we have to have essential nutrition. Most of these modern day vegetables that we plant, be it transplants or seed, are considered modern day hybrids. They're commercial varieties brought into the home gardening market. So in order for them to be successful, you have to have adequate nutrition from start to end. So let's give you some guidelines of how to get that race running to put your running shoes on so you can get an A at the end. So here's a good guideline. Um, Manure-based compost, uh, which is the organic material, uh, you want to make sure it's properly aged and properly decomposed. You don't want to use fresh manures or coarse material. You want to work that into the minimum of your planting area. Two inches of material worked into at least six inches of soil. So a lot of times we don't own a roller tiller, but if you need to take back the area after you get the weeds and rocks out of there, then you might rent a tiller and work this in. But the nutrition is very important. We have always recommended a 312 or 412 ratio analysis. For instance, a 1959, a 19 would be the nitrogen, the green, green and grow the plant. The middle number of the five is phosphorus for crown and flowering development. And the third number, nine, is potassium. So in the Central South Texas market, we've been using this for over 40 years. This is the same fertilizer that we use on most of our lawns in the springtime. Since it's slow release, we do not use slow release uh, fertilizers in the fall on our lawns, just in the spring around mid-April to early May, or as a rule of thumb after the second or third major mowing in the springtime or the same that we typically use around established trees, shrubs, and perennials, both in early March and again in early September, and both for your spring and fall vegetable garden. So this is what we consider a pre-plant granulated fertilizer. We work in about three pounds, up to five pounds, so three pounds is usually adequate, up to 100 square feet, with that two inches of manure-based, properly aged, decomposed compost to a depth of six inches. That should give most of us ample nutrition to run this race, to grow plants. That's what we're doing, is we're growing leaves, photosynthesis, sunlight, the essential nutrition to run this race. So we have big, healthy plants, and then later an abundance of broccoli, cabbage, tomatoes, and other things that we're trying to grow out there. Remember, compost is not fertilizer. Compost is a soil amendment. Many of us lack ample organic material in the soil. And you know, when you do raised bed gardenings or even container gardenings, by the end of summer, that organic material has decomposed and it's broken down, so you have to add. So that's what we do on major planting beds, both in the spring and for the fall vegetable garden is keep adding to it to build it over time. That organic material also acts as a sponge. So uh, it might help a little bit with uh, nutrient uptake by the plants as well. And it helps uh, hold the moisture in uh, to make it much more available to the plants too. So your plant is growing. So for instance, we have a little uh, green magic broccoli here. This plant was planted about man, three weeks ago. A very young, healthy transplant. This is the third week that it's been growing, and that's what we want. This plant has doubled in size. It has a more abundance of leaves. We planted on the second leaf stage. So it's doubled in size. We want plenty of leaves. We want it to grow healthy and clean. So you don't see any insect marks on it or wind damage. It's a very, very healthy plant. So I am a very, very strong believer that on transplants, you're getting 
extension recommended varieties from your local independent nursery, working with a Texas certified nursery professional, uh, plants that are not just grown in a greenhouse and, and out there and put out in the hot sun, but have been properly acclimated with the heat and wind. And once a week, once a week for the first three weeks on these transplants, I would also use a water soluble, good water soluble fertilizer. Uh, and if you keep them in containers, do that weekly. So on third week of these ground plantings of vegetables, you see a little bit granulated fertilizer, uh, you're spoon feeding and that's called side dressing. So we put a couple of teaspoons of that 1959 on week three as well. And we lightly scratch it in and then water it in thoroughly after we apply it, but, but on the outskirts of the, of the plant, so we're not damaging the root system and we're lightly scratching it. So again, nutrition is what we're gonna run this race with. If you don't have adequate nutrition to push these plants, you're not gonna be successful. And that's why we recommend a slow release fertilizer, such as the 1959 as a pre-plant fertilizer at the initial planting stage. So keep plants mulch, particularly when you do July and August plantings with the heat uh, you water the plants in real well. You mulch them. One of my favorites is a native hardwood mulch. Uh, maybe with a little bit of compost and blend it into it. You don't want very coarse material. You want aged and shredded material. Uh, two, two, two. Twice a year, a two inch layer, uh, two inches away from the crown of the plant. And in May, I would do this for our spring planting before it starts really getting hot. Um, or even mid-April to May. And then anytime you put mulch, if you're direct seeding, seeding in your vegetable garden, you don't want to put the mulch so the plants germinate from the soil um, because that might impede the growth of the germination of that little seedling, squash, zucchini, cucumbers, bush beans, other. So mulching does help. This is just some uh, regular hay that uh, people have used, but depending where, what part of the state you're at, we really prefer the double shredded hardwood mulch, which is a native mulch for our central and south Texas. So let's briefly cover about warm weather crops because that's the main, main crop that we wanna get planted. Uh, people, when they finish their spring garden, they start thinking about warm weather crops, particularly fall tomatoes, as early as the 4th of July weekend, and then the months of July and August. And you really, really have to get most of all your warm weather crops planted by mid to late August, no later than the first week of September. Uh, and then you transition going into September, October with cool weather crops. So this is a picture uh, from a spring planting um lots of tomatoes and that's what we want we want to get an a these are just a few of the last tomatoes that were harvested off a few plants and when you pick your plants be it a fruit tree or a vegetable tomato or other you don't need a lot of plants just do a real real good job on the few plants that you have so you can get a, a tremendous amount of harvest of quality and a quantity a yield of fruit as well now, let's talk about spring and now. Small fruited tomatoes, small fruited tomatoes, hot peppers, uh, and even sweet peppers like bell peppers, eggplant, both the large, uh, large ones like Black Beauty or Florida Market, or the Asian types, like Ikeban and other Asian ones, the smaller, skinnier types, and pole beans. All those types of plants, if they still look nice and healthy from spring planting, and they're free of insects, disease, and spider mites, and you were able to keep them clean of that and well watered, well fertilized, well weeded through the months of late June 
July and the hot, hot August, you can carry all these crops into the fall planting. So what we normally do at that time around mid-August is we do light pruning on them, maybe a third of a removal. Remember, pruning is a dwarfing and rejuvenation process, kind of cutting the centers out of the plants, fertilizing, kicking that up some, and replenishing that organic mulch around them. And then they should flush out with new growth uh, going into September, and you should have a pretty good a fall crop as well. Now, research shows from the past, if your plants have, of these plants that we're showing you, which are all warm weather crops, have declined, then July and August is the time to put out fresh transplants. And we've have looked at putting fresh transplants out versus potential carryovers from spring planting. And we have found out, particularly these ones we've talked about, small fruited tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, and whole beans, the new transplants, and of course the beans are gonna be directly seeded, you don't set out transplants, will always, will always outperform, outproduce carryover. So the decision is yours, or go ahead and go forward and plant a few new healthy plants. Again, Start out with quality plants and quality seeds. Make sure they're uh, reputable. Make sure they are extension recommended varieties. And both on the Aggie Horticulture website and plantanswers.com, as well as your county extension agent anywhere in the state and their master gardener associations uh, should have a recommended list of vegetable varieties that should be typically available in your part of the state and that have made the test of time. So let's start talking about large fruited tomatoes a little bit. So celebrity has always been the old traditional standby. It's a semi-determinant tomato. So let's kind of, when we talk about fall tomatoes, let's kind of use the same guidelines as we use in February, when we release the rodeo tomato every year at the San Antonio Livestock Exposition. So our master gardeners sell a rodeo tomato that we, we uh, look at locally and statewide with our trials. We have the oldest tomato trials in the state here. And we use Celebrity and Tycoon as two controls of all these newer ones we're looking at. So a lot of people buy these rodeo tomatoes in February to support the scholarship fund, but a lot of people don't plant them because they're worried about the cold weather or cool weather during that time. So be it celebrity, which is a semi-determinant or a determinant one like Valley Cat, we tell people to uh, pot them up. You know, pot them up in February and then 30 days, you can stagger your plantings throughout the month of March, no later than early April. That's the same philosophy in the 4th of July weekend. Uh, July or going into August, maybe pot a few up, put them in large number one uh, containers, and you can find all the details on plantanswers.com. Uh, under the rodeo tomatoes and how to pot them up. You know, an adequate size uh, a container, little stick on that uh, tomato, a good potting mix, ample water and fertility. So you can put something larger in the ground in mid to late August, early September. If you go forward in putting these transplants, smaller ones, kind of scatter them, plant a few small transplants now, See what kind of success you have with July and August heat. And then these other larger ones, you size them up for about 30 days and then put them in in mid to late August, no later than the first week of September. We always start out with healthy plants uh, when you're planting. So if you're planting in July and August, possibly all the way to mid-September or a standard practice 12 months out on your vegetable garden, 
This is a must, is drip or micro irrigation. You never plant on dry soil. You always have enough sun. You start out with clean and pristine, no weeds. But July and August is so, so hot. We want to minimize the leaves getting wet because that proliferates disease and other issues. So when you use a drip or micro sprinkler irrigation on your vegetable garden, you're minimizing the weeds because you're only getting a certain spot wet with moisture. So that orifice, and there's different setups, and we have a lot more uh, information that you can help set up your irrigation system for your vegetable garden, both on plantanswers.com and on the Aggie Horticulture website. So you're mudding them in, you're putting that transplant right in that wet spot in that mud, kind of like an IV. So it's constantly getting that adequate moisture. So you got to know how to how much water to put out because you don't want to, you know, an inch to two inches is a good rule of thumb on vegetable and fruit production during the heat of summer. So you don't want to rot the plant out. So you got to have to get a good feel for it because unfortunately people over irrigate. Remember, plants do not waste water. People waste water. So if you plant a plant and you don't use the drip irrigation to lot of ice and miss one watering, the plant's probably gonna be so stressed or just simply dying, it's not forgiving. The drip irrigation is really, really the key. But you should always pre-moisten, you know, either hopefully we get a well-timed rainfall or you're watering that area and addressing any weeds that come out before you set these plants out. Because again, never set out plants that are dry or plant on soil. So the drip irrigation is not the answer if the soil is super dry because you want adequate deep moisture in that soil profile for planting. Technology is important. We've a lot of us have embraced much more technology uh, these last few months. Some people will set up a timer on their drip irrigation system, but you got to make sure that you're out there often. Dr. Sam Cotner always used to say the best person in your garden with a sharp rubbing hoe and an inquisitive attitude and your notebook is is your shadow you're out there once twice a day possibly watching these plants grow um making sure that how can i get better next time what did i do wrong writing that down in your journal but if you don't have batteries in your timer on your drip irrigation system or if you leave for three weeks and the water's not turned off or somebody accidentally turned off this is a situation that you get into so you have to you have to be inquisitive you have to be out there often keeping an eye on things so just don't think that technology and drip irrigation is going to fix it all in july and august or throughout the year, so you still got to be out there often. Your shadow is the best person out there in your garden. You're out there often. So this is our early plantings uh, back in uh, when we set out early March uh, plantings of tomatoes. Uh, that works good for the wind, uh, particularly with early plantings. It acts as a windbreak. Uh, gives a plant four to five degrees of extra winter protection. It also acts as an insect barrier. Um, that's a UV light in there. So this is the insulate uh, or grow web cloth that we use at our children's garden here in San Antonio. So when you plant these determinate uh, type bush type tomatoes, they grow, they flower, they set, they're in and out, spring and fall, the same varieties that we recommend. Now your tomato case should be four to five feet tall, a 16 to 20 inch diameter, uh, and then anchor with shepherd hooks on the bottom to support the top evidence of the cage and when the plant grows. So you don't really need to use these white cloth on fall planting, but you do need to make sure you use an adequate tomato cage to grow these plants both in the spring and in the fall as well as um, anchor them down. That's very, very important uh, to use that when you grow tomatoes. So 
like I said, we're not going to be covering a ton of varieties. I'll show you a couple of dates on uh, other varieties like tomatoes and fall and winter vegetables. So that's the principles that we want to cover. We want you to make sure you're in full sun. We want you to make sure you have adequate organic material and nutrition worked into the soil. You're keeping those weeds clean. You start out clean, you finish clean, weed management, proper watering, and then study up and find out what are the best extension recommended plants that will do for that A for your planting season. So we always conclude our seminars with a bonus plant. And really, we're not gonna just show you one plant today, but we're showing you a resource of the new 2020 brochure for the Texas Superstar Plant Program. Hot off the press, you might say. The last publication was in 2016. Uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and Research through Texas Department of Agriculture and our Texas Nursery and Landscape Association have put this together and it's archived on the TexasSuperstar.com website, which you can go off the homepage of the Aggie Horticulture website. 96 plants are there. Most of them are perennial type plants, a few tree, a few fruit, and a handful, a handful of vegetables, including some tomatoes on there. So that's your bonus plant or brochure for today. Check it out, a lot of great information to add to your landscape this fall as well. Remember, we always wanna add landscape diversity. Many of those plants should be Texas Superstar plants, particularly the perennial type plants. And you can learn all that on that new brochure as well. We should have something blooming 12 months out of the year, uh, not only for aesthetics and the prettiness of blooms and hardy perennials, but also to build your beneficial insects 12 months out of the year, uh, bees to pollinate your squashes, zucchini, cucumbers, melons, and things like that, as well as beneficial insects. So landscape diversity in your vegetable garden and in and around your landscape will long-term and be a good earth kind steward of the environment to reduce the pesticide uses as well. So these are the websites. Aggie Horticulture, plantanswers.com. Lots of great information, particularly on vegetable gardening and other gardening and landscape uh, information as well. The middle one is the Bear County Extension Service website. So you can see what we do locally here and then other webinars that we have scheduled uh, by myself and our other colleagues as well. I didn't mention Dr. Sam Cotner. Uh, but what he did for the Texas gardening for home gardeners and commercial folks is unbelievable. This is a must for your home library. If you're very, very serious about vegetable gardening and you do not have this as part of your uh, collection, you need to add it. You can get it from Texas Gardening Magazine online. Uh, it even shows you a way uh, through reinforcing wire how to make your own tomato cages and all the great information that it has on there. It has all the families of vegetables and gives you old world, new world information on them. And that will also help you down the line when you do crop rotation uh, between families of plants. So you're not planting the same all the time in there. Dr. Sam Codner, the Texas vegetable book, which you can buy from the Texas Gardening Magazine. Another great resource particularly for in and around the San Antonio and Bear County area, is our Children's Vegetable Garden Program blog. Uh, we're the stewards of the uh, one of the nation's oldest Saturday morning vegetable gardening programs at our beautiful San Antonio uh, Botanical Garden with our Bear County Master Gardeners. We have a lot of archived information there of previous plantings, and we have the formula down here in Bear County and San Antonio we have a grower that's been doing this for almost 60 years, growing the right extension recommended varieties, not only for farmers on, in and around Texas, but for backyard gardeners and nurseries, the independent nurseries have these plants at the right time, the best varieties. So 
So uh, our school gardens program, which is one of the largest that we oversee too, uh, everybody's on the same page that so we have success this way and uh, uh, planning the right plants at the right time and all that information is archived on that blog as well. So thank you for attending today. There's our Bear County uh, link there to the website of uh, this and other uh, webinars that we've done, horticulture, gardening, entomology, and our colleagues at the Extension Office is all archived at the My Extension 210 site, capital M, capital E, one word, at My Extension 210 uh, YouTube channel. Please subscribe uh, to it, and we have a lot of great, great, great information archived there. Please write these notes down so when you go to the Bear County Extension Service website at bear-tx.tamu.edu, we have a couple of other that ties into today's, uh, uh, today was principles and getting ready for major planting. The big thing you need to get going now is the tomatoes, or if you want to upgrade uh, fresh peppers and eggplants into larger containers the same way. As to the tomatoes, you can do that as well and scatter your plantings in the month of August. So we're going to really, really get into Tomato 101 on Tuesday, August 11th. And then Tuesday, August 25th, we're going to really get to planting your, your uh, warm weather crops towards the end and going into planting cool weather crops going into uh, September and October. More specifics on crops and varieties at that time. So mark those two dates and those subject uh, matters down. So that's my email address again. I hope everyone had a good time today and learned a little bit. If you have any emails, uh, questions that need to be emailed to me, don't hesitate. Um, send me uh, anything related to this or gardening or landscape related. And if you need something identified, please, please, a semi-quality image that's attached to the email and not part of it. So we always uh, tell folks, thank you for being here. Remember, always learn and have fun. And then happy gardening, everyone.